A Karen tries to get me fired by forging documents, but I had the real copies all along and I ruined her business for life. And in the process, I got a settlement check for $50,000 because of it. Here's how it happened. Sometime back, I was hired to a company by a CEO I had previously worked for someplace else. He was a good friend, so when his newest company wasn't achieving sales, he headhunted me to join the new one. The company hadn't made a sale in two years. Year one, the software product was in beta, so it wasn't ready to be sold. Year two, they realized using the tech staff to make high-end sales to C-level executives was the worst sales model that one could conceptualize. In general, there are exceptions, of course. These two personality styles don't speak the same language. Tech people talk tech, buyers talk benefits, and how the potential product fills needs. I bridge the gap, well, by translating the tech speak into natural conversational language so the buyers understand how their needs will be filled. The job was an hour and a half drive one way from my home, so the CEO said I could work from home as long as I kept the sales management tool current. It's where you keep notes of each prospect status. Also that I came to important meetings and made sure the executive team had daily sales reports. The first month I made the daily three hour commute because I needed to have solid constant interaction with all departments to rapidly form my sales strategy and develop a two way confidence level with the section heads. Once I had a handle on things I was ready to launch my sales plan. In the meantime the CEO hired a vice president of sales, we'll call them BB, who started four days before before I hit the ground running to get in front of buyers. She was a VP coming from the banking industry and had a long career in sales and marketing and finance products. I hated her from the moment she arrived. She knew nothing about tech and I spent a huge time trying to orient her, which wasn't ideal because I needed to work on my sales strategy. They brought her on board because she had strong experience in gaining financial investors. Nevertheless, I forged ahead, traveled to a target state and spent 19 days crisscrossing it. When I came back, I had 17 contracts from buyers totaling about $2 million in sales. My CEO was overjoyed. Fast forward six months and now working from home, I'm rocking and rolling. Sales are strong. CEO is happy. Good things are happening. BB has landed an investor willing to drop $6 million into the company and they are coming into town for a discovery meeting. She asked me to drive up because they specifically want to meet the salesperson. Seconds before walking in the door for the big meeting, BB pulls me aside and says she needs me to back her up on a lie that she has told them. She basically doubled my sales numbers. I told her there was no way I was going to do that. She says the CEO has okayed the lie. We get to the part in the talk where the investor is looking over my inflated sales numbers on the prospectus, then directly asks me how many sales I'm making a month. BB is behind him waving her arms, but I was having none of it and answered truthfully. He looks confused staring at the document, which has the false number listed, while she's giving me the stink eye behind him. No one says a word. There's dead silence. I asked to see the document and fates have aligned allowing me to solve the dilemma. I explained the first two numbers were transposed. They correlated well to my real sales versus inflated sales if you flip flop the first two digits. Potential investor is satisfied and we moved on. Switched gears. About a week later, I was meeting with the CIO in his office and he referred to my big boobs. I'm no shrinking violet but it stunned me because it was so unexpected. That night I was chatting with my BFF who happens to be a lawyer and told him about it in a casual conversation. He says I should tell the CEO so he can address it. Thinking along smart business practices, I decided to tell BB to whom I directly report as proper protocol since we don't have an HR department yet. Side note, I also reported directly to CIO as a boss since my role was a muddy mix of sales and tech. The next day, the CEO calls me and I take him through it, telling him it's no big deal, but to make sure he talked to CIO so it doesn't happen again. He says he'll do that right away. Two days later, I check in with him and the CEO still hasn't talked to the CIO about it because investors were in town. I gently push him to get it done and casually mention my best friend who happened to be a lawyer was the one who urged me to tell him because, quote, any good CEO would want to know about it. I reiterate that I'm not mad or upset. The only word he heard was lawyer. He went ape that I was bringing a lawyer into the mix. Now, this guy was my good friend. We'd worked together at two companies for years. I calmed him down or so I thought, explaining that I only wanted him to talk to CIO. I also told him I hadn't brought a lawyer into it. I had been innocently chatting with my BFF who just happens to be a criminal defense attorney. He seemed okay and we hung up. The next day I'm working as usual and I get a call from an attorney who explained the company has hired her regarding my sexual harassment claim. I am flamoxed and adamantly told her that was not the case and that I had no claim against the company. She said otherwise. 
otherwise. That's when everything changed dramatically. The CEO was furious with me for bringing this on when investors were looking at us. His reaction set the tone, which filtered down. The company began to retaliate against me. BB now made it her mission to make my life hell, forgetting to tell me about important meetings that I was supposed to attend, freezing me out when I was in the office, telling me I can no longer even speak to CIO, a problem since I'm selling a multi-million dollar tech product needing his input, and I reported to him directly as my other boss, denying me a long planned approved vacation, basically anything she could devise in order to mess with me, she was gleefully working it. Coinciding with this was a serious health problem I developed that ultimately required surgery. My illness had no impact on my work as I was able to work from home, which made things easier on me health-wise. BB then decided that I needed to come to the office every day despite the three-hour round-trip commute. Now, I know what you're thinking. Why didn't I just leave or get another job somewhere else? Well, I needed the health insurance. There was no way to turn around another job fast enough, and I had a complex surgery scheduled requiring three surgeons for my procedure. My doctor gave me a note for them, which released me from having to make the daily commutes so I could continue to work at home. As long as my work didn't suffer, they legally couldn't force me to commute, especially since working from home was part of my employment contract from the outset. The night before my surgery, BB calls to tell me they've canceled my health insurance. After hanging up with BB, I collapsed on the floor, fainting. I was so, so, so sick and mentally exhausted from all the stress. The next morning, the CEO frantically calls asking to talk to me. My mom refuses to let him in. I'm on official leave as of that morning and we're heading to the hospital. The CEO had told their lawyer about canceling my health insurance and she chewed him up, telling him that it was illegal. They immediately reinstated my insurance. In the two weeks I was out, my mom had found a lawyer for me as it was clear shenanigans were going on. I still needed them as an employer because I was in no shape to rigorously job hunt while recovering. Turns out all the BS they were doing to me is illegal. Companies aren't allowed to retaliate against employees when they report nefarious acts against them. I met with my new lawyer who said I had an excellent claim for retaliation and took me on. He said I had to continue working there while he did his thing to stay within the protocol while he filed an EEOC claim. Now, it's time for me to return to work and the company has relocated plan during my absence and BB refused to tell me so I couldn't come back to work. Company lawyer told them they had to tell me so BB gives me the wrong directions making me late one day. I walk in the new office and it looks like any other place except for one thing. There's a wide open area directly in front of the CEO's glass office with a single desk in the middle of it. Welcome to my new desk. Also, I wasn't allowed to do sales anymore. In fact, I wasn't allowed to do anything at all, period. They had hired a bunch of new people to the company and they had treated me like a pariah. It turns out BB had gone to them telling a pack of lies and if they know what's good for them, they'll stay away. Since I had nothing to do but couldn't just sit there looking like a dope, I worked on documenting everything being done to me per my lawyer's advice. I was meticulous in my note-taking. BB began writing me up, stupid stuff like not answering my phone on the first ring or asking questions during company-wide meetings, asking to see my personnel file, which employees are legally entitled to do, although not entitled to photocopy any of it. Each time she wrote me up, I had to sign the write-up. There was space for me to reply to it, so I consistently wrote, I do not agree with this assessment. It infuriated her so much she wrote me up again for writing the statement that I didn't agree with it. There were several instances where she called me into her office and literally began screaming at me loudly and enthusiastically. I wouldn't engage though. My standard answer to everything was okay, which made her apoplectic. At one point, she's inches from my face screaming, her face beat red, and I just sat there with a dreamy expression whilst envisioning her blowing a vein in her head, stroking out. I infuriated her with my equanimity. Still in all, I was in it to win it at this point. It didn't matter what new humiliation they dished out. It took all with a bland face. Then she went to my desk and documented it in my notebook. She loathed my notebook, sure that I was doing exactly what I was doing, documenting, because it was my personal property though she couldn't take it from me. I had to carry all my belongings with me everywhere, company-wide meetings, the bathroom, lunch, etc. Because I caught her one time going through my desk drawer in my purse, although it gave me great joy to write a note reading FU, which I left in my backpack, and jerry-rigging it so I could tell if she went into it, which she did. I withstood it all with a brave face only breaking down once I left for the day. My attorney took a lot of sobbing phone calls during this period. Finally came the day that my attorney has what he needs and I can resign. Better yet, he advises I don't have to give a two-week notice. I come back from lunch and type up my letter with one sentence. I resign immediately. 
immediately. I take it to the HR guy, who also took part in their evil plans, and I handed it to him. His mouth forms an O shape, and he half stands up from his chair as he reads it. He looks up, and I give him a smile and say, bye-bye, just as sweet as pie, walked out the door, and drove home feeling mighty fine. One month later, my lawyer and I are at the EEOC office, along with the CEO, BB, and their lawyer, so the EEOC can review my claim. In my state, you can't just bring a lawsuit against the company for things like harassment and retaliation. Claims must be first evaluated by the EEOC, and then, if they determine you have enough grounds to file a lawsuit, they issue a right to sue document. My lawyer presented the case logically and forthright, detailing all of the evidence. It took him 40 minutes to go through all of it, then they presented their side with allegations of my poor employment, along with their evidence, which were all the copious write-ups that BB had written. EEOC asked about the timeline of the write-ups, inquiring that if they were before or after my claim occurred. BB was wearing a smug, self-satisfied smile, stated they were all prior to my claim as noted by the dates on each document. EEOC looks at my lawyer, and my lawyer looks at me. I look at BB and then serenely pull out my photocopies of the documents whilst handing them to the EEOC lady. BB barks, She's not supposed to have those! They're company property! I show EEOC lady that the dates have clearly been altered by BB. She had made copies with the dates blanked out and then backdated them. You see, whenever she wrote me up, I had to take the document personally to the CEO to put into my personnel file. Along the way, though, I stopped at the copier and I took copies. She never knew I was doing this. You could hear a pin drop. The EEOC lady reviews the copies and slowly sets them on the table. She didn't say anything for a long time and then spoke. I can remember her words exactly to this day. I have seen a lot of ill treatment and illegal undertakings by both employees and employers, including forged and altered documents, but I have never seen someone so incredibly stupid to present documents this easily disproved. Not only are employees entitled to receive and keep a copy of formal write-ups, but reading these ridiculous allegations, it's obvious you are trying to manufacture your case. She went on to say that I had a clear case for a lawsuit and moreover, I could win it. She recommended their side to go into another room and determine the settlement amount to pay me immediately or risk the lawsuit. They went to a nearby office and I could hear the lawyer dressing them down. Words I heard included, lied to me, lied to EEOC, presenting false documents, broke so many laws, figure out a number big enough to pay her so this doesn't go to court because you will lose. And they came back with a $50,000 offer, which we accepted. My lawyer and I left and then did a football touchdown dance in the parking lot. Looking up at the EEOC window, I could see BB in the window looking down, miserable and crying. She had just been fired. And that was my year one revenge. I'm not a hateful person. I get mad and get over it. But for BB, I nurtured hatred and vowed to one day get revenge. So I kept tabs on her and discovered she opened a finance marketing company after she was fired. Then I waited a year before exacting my petty delights. Over the past 18 years, I've executed a wonderful soul refreshing project. Each year I go to her website and write down all the work email addresses and phone numbers for the employees. Then I subscribe them all to get more information from places like online school online insurance companies, all those BS aggressive organizations that will keep your contact information longer than a witch's curse. The last few years, I've subscribed them to an email bomb service where the service takes the address and instantly subscribes it to thousands of newsletters, requests for more information, feeds and other online buyers of email addresses for marketing services. I tested it with a burner email and it wrecks havoc on your inbox with thousands of emails received within seconds and they never, never, never stop. You literally have to close on the email because it can't be salvaged. Each year when I go to collect the contact information, all the emails have been changed to new ones. Last year, my cousin took a job in the same building and I enlisted her help and made it a point to befriend a receptionist working for BB. After executing my yearly plan, my cousin went to lunch with her. The receptionist was in a foul mood and explained the entire organization was in disarray because IT had to redo all the emails again. She said, quote, it keeps happening over and over again and nobody can figure out why. She said the owner, BB, has had to get her cell phone number replaced three times because of all the texts and phone calls she gets whenever it happens again. Sometimes BB would have her phone number on the website which I duly subscribe to everything under the sun. The best part for me was hearing how she lost a mega client because they felt the company was in too much turmoil so often. The thought of this keeps me warm and cozy at night and I sleep so, so very well. So, was I the jerk? This is one of those situations where if they just would have listened to what the OP was saying in the very beginning, all of this would have been avoided. The OP felt uncomfortable by what the C CIO said and all she was trying to do was ask the CEO to talk with the CIO. But instead, they immediately thought the OP was out to get them, even though the OP had been friends with the CEO because they worked
worked together before. So that's what ended up getting the whole snowball rolling in the first place. It ultimately ended up with them forging the documents to try and get the win against the OP, which was really easy to disprove, as the lady in charge said. So if you were in this situation, how would you have handled it? Would you keep coming back year after year to do this whole email bomb thing, or would you have left it at the $50,000 settlement? Let me know down below. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube with notifications turned on and follow the podcast. But either way, see you guys next time.